Welcome to uh, the latest podcast then. This is a podcast during the bye week for the Seahawks. They're not in action in week six, but still plenty to discuss as we look ahead to the rest of the season and what we've seen so far. Rob Staten with you, Robbie Williams with you as well. Uh, Robbie, the Seahawks are 5-0 and going into this bye week. Couldn't be any better. Uh, you know, it can be a little bit deceptive though, a record, because 5-0 and sounds great. The Seahawks certainly have played very well on offense. But there are, there are things to work on moving forward if the Seahawks are really going to max out their potential. Because let's not forget, last year they were 10-2. and two. They were very much in the NFC West race. In the end, they didn't win the division. They had a very early playoff exit, as they have done ever since they got to the Super Bowl in the 2014 season. So I think, yeah, 5-0 and looks great. But there are still areas to improve, aren't there? Yeah, I mean, you can't really ask for much better at 5-0. and I mean, yeah, I mean, you could ask for the defense playing a little bit better. But, I mean... They're finding a way to make the stops when they need to, and this is what championship teams do. They make stops. They win games that they're supposed to win. Um, they're not all going to be pretty, and you know, you, you know, hopefully it's building confidence uh, with that defense as well as the offense. Um, you know, going forward, point when they get in some of these tougher games, uh, they they'll be battle tested and ready to go. So, really good first half of the or first quarter of the season for sure. We're going to talk about some of the positives and some of the negatives that we've seen so far this year. But one thing I have noticed, Robbie, that I wanted to sort of flag up in this podcast is that I, I can see a lot of people, particularly on, on Seahawks Twitter, that are absolutely determined to talk this defense into not being as bad as it is. You know, it's like, oh, look, they're graded. They're only graded 19th by uh, DVOA. The, oh, look, PFF have, have graded them as the sixth best off defense in the league, which, I mean, if you ever needed anything, to question the PFF grades, there you go. And, you know, I think with many of in these instances, Robbie, it, it's an average. You know, the Seahawks haven't been tested in the run game, so their run game numbers are down. They probably grade quite highly in that regard. And in the passing defense, they're going to be sort of anywhere between 25 and 32. When you average it out, it kind of looks pretty average. But we know better. We've actually seen the defense. And, and even if it does grade, you know, higher than 10 other teams in the league or whatever, that doesn't really matter. The problem is, is if it's as bad as this when you get to the playoffs, if you have to go to Green Bay and win a game, if you have to play the Rams in the playoffs and win a game, if you, there are other teams that they're going to come up against as well. You know, the Saints might be able to move the ball on, on this defense. That's when you need them to be performing better than they are now because while it's great to be 5-0, and it's the games that matter. The two coming up against the Rams and those playoff games that are going to determine whether this is more of the same from the Seahawks or a step forward from the last few years? I have a really hard time uh, caring about rankings and status. Like, you know, I saw ESPN had us ranked at number one, and, you know, you could argue us being down to eight, you know, or nine even. It's hard, it's hard to go and justify, you know, rankings off of that. But it, when you start looking at it and you look at these other teams and you're looking at, you know, just the NFL as a whole and offenses are, are – are rising. I was listening to John Clayton earlier this week and he was talking about he expects, you know, the defenses to catch back up. And normally it's the other way around. We talked about it earlier and before the season started that usually offenses are the ones that come out and struggle early and the defenses are the ones that steps up. Now, I don't know if this has something to do with just a lot of the rule changes and protecting quarterbacks and, you know, defenseless receivers and all these kind of things and helmet to helmet hits and all these things. But I mean, you look, start looking at like the numbers overall and the numbers are a lot higher. There's a lot of high scoring games going on. So I have a hard time really looking at the numbers, but when you do look at the numbers and, and start to like look at the data as far as like where the Seahawks rank against the other teams, you see that, like, you know, our past defense is not very good. You know, we haven't been battle tested on the run. And then last week we had 200 yards rushing on us in one game. So obviously it's going to fluctuate with that. It just depends on the teams you're coming. We're coming up with some teams that are going to be playing that are going to run the football a lot. So I imagine these numbers will be skewed even more and it's hard to, it's hard for me to get behind numbers on uh you know, what people are actually just ranking us. And I mean, you look at the data and it makes sense, but you, it's tough to, to see where we actually fit. And especially when you know we're not done adding to this defense. We know this defense isn't done. We know we're, we're not done adding to it. So hopefully we can get the pieces in place that can help us push forward. We'll talk a bit more about the trade options in a moment. I just want to send this message to anybody who is, who is watching this podcast who is tempted to send a tweet to Dan Hanzus or anybody else on Twitter because they've dared to put the Seahawks at number six in a power ranking. Six is not bad. If you are in the top six for the NFL, that is really good. 
there's a chance that when he gets to the postseason, the number six team can get to the Super Bowl. It is not if you put him at 16th after that Minnesota game, you could have a, an issue there. You could send him a. I actually saw another journalist write an article saying, if you were really annoyed by Dan Hanzus's, uh six number six ranking in their power ranking, here's another one that one of our guys has put together where the Seahawks are first. And it's like, is that how delicate Seahawks fans are now that if they're not ranked first in the NFL, having, I mean, look, Dan Hanzus watched the Minnesota game and he saw that if, that, if, if Alexander Matteson gets another half inch and gets a first down there, that's an absolute arse kicking on, on Sunday night. And you wouldn't have even had them at number six. So the 5-0, and he's put him at six. It's completely fair. If you put him at one, it's fair. You could make a justification based on the way that Wilson's playing. If you put him at four, it's fair. If you put him at six behind the Steelers and the Packers and the Chiefs and the, and the Ravens and, you know, whoever else, you know, the Rams, then that's fine as well. Six isn't bad. Calm down. Enjoy the season. It's not too bad. Um, right, let's have a look at the rest of the NFC West because this, you know, they've not played any NFC West opponent yet, Robbie. This is where, for me, the division is going to get sorted. And this is where the Seahawks have to win. You know, they've, they've won the division once in the last five years. They have to win the NFC West. That will give them, a, a, even if it's not as the number one seed, it gives them an opportunity to win a home playoff game and get some momentum into their postseason. Maybe even play a couple of home playoff games. That is when this team gets to the Super Bowl. That's what history has said. So win the NFC West, give yourself the number one or the number two seed and the best chance to get through a difficult postseason route. So this is the big moment now. Their next game is against Arizona. They play the Rams and the Niners as well. Key part of the season for me. What do you think? Yeah, I think the first game right out the gate is going to be our, our big test, you know, going against Arizona. They're, <clears throat> they, they just lost Chandler Jones for the year. You know, they're, they're, they've got a few injuries, but they, you know, they're, they're young and they're, they're playing really well. As, and, and then at the same time, they're not playing well. You're right. They, they just, they're, they're, they're all over the place. So you don't know what kind of Cardinals team you're going to get. So this is where we need to go in and show right away, like establish our NFC dominance, go in and beat the teams that we need to be in the NFC West. That's what matters the most. We'll do a bigger preview on the Cardinals game um, next week as well. Just to look at the rest of the NFC West though. For me, Robbie, it all looks a little bit different than maybe it did a month ago. Cause you know, the Niners, a really, I mean, it's not just a couple of injuries for the Niners. I mean, if it was just Jimmy G who was out and you were coming up against that fearsome defensive line, but with C.J. Beathard or Nick Mullen as the quarterback, I still think that would be an incredibly difficult game. However, when you take Nick Bosa out, D. Ford out, they've traded DeForest Buckner, they've, got, they've lost Richard Sherman. You know, their receivers have been a little bit banged up. George Kittle hasn't been 100%. Jimmy G is injured again, and then C.J. Beathard, and, and Nick Mullen is still going to be playing at quarterback. That's an awful lot of injuries that uh, Shanahan has to deal with in San Francisco. And for me, that game and, and the, the Niners as a whole, I mentioned this on another podcast this week. I don't want to tempt fate. I, I really don't want to tempt fate, Robbie, and, and write them off. But it did just pop into my head a little bit this week that you just don't, are they going to end up with a top five draft pick? You know, are they going to end up in the top five again? Are they going to struggle this year now, end up in the top five and fluke their way to Jamar Chase or Penny Sewell or Mika Parsons or one of these, you know, it's a really good draft to be in the top five or even a quarterback. Are, is that going to happen or are they going to be too good for that? Is this too premature to be talking in those terms? Should I be showing them a bit more respect? I mean, yeah, maybe a little more respect. I mean, they've been – I don't know if there's been a team that's been as injured as the Niners this year. I mean, they've been devastated by injuries. And and this is still a good football team, and Kyle Shanahan is still a really good football coach. You know, he's he's got these guys playing. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I would probably say give them a little more respect, just the simple fact they are 2-3 and three right now. Uh, you, you know, they still have a lot of the NFC least games to play as well, so they should win a lot of those regardless of what they have. So, I think well, I think saying that, I mean, they played they played the Jets and the Giants, so they've had the two extra true. bye weeks this year. The two wins were against the two winless teams in New York, and you know that wasn't just a loss on Sunday. I mean, they were torn to shreds by Miami. If they'd have lost twenty seven twenty, maybe look at it differently. Well, they gave up forty odd points and looked hopeless. I mean, that was a really alarming performance and result for the Niners. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they just didn't look very good at all. I mean, Miami came out and just punched them in the face right out the gate, and then just they just kept going. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, you're right. They did play the Giants and, and, and the Jets already. And actually, and they already played the Eagles and, and lost the Eagles. Um, so I guess the only game they have left is Washington but oh, well, and, and, and Dallas. But, I mean, yeah, you look at it, and you, you, this is still a team that I think can play. And as they start getting healthier and getting guys back, you know, hopefully they, they'll start winning. So you want them to win a few more football games. Like, I don't want them in the top five, right? I mean, you got to start rooting for them to win some games. And, you know, hopefully they'll split with maybe the Rams and, and the Cardinals there too. So, yeah, that's a team that you don't want to have in the top five because when they come back next year, they're going to look dangerous if that's the case. A perfectly crappy seven and nine will do for me, uh, for the Niners, as long as two of those nine are for, uh, for the Seahawks. And then you look at the rest of it. But Buffalo, again, there's another, another team there, Robbie. Before the Tennessee Titans game, the Seahawks will go to, to Buffalo in week nine. Before that Titans game, you're looking at the Bills and thinking, wow, you know, just how good is this Bills team? Josh Allen's playing like an MVP candidate. They're going to tie the Titans and have the, you know, the wheels blown off in that game. I mean, they were run all over. Um, Josh Allen looked like Josh Allen has looked at times in his career. And they didn't really have much of an answer there. And, you know, again, that is going to be a really difficult game in week nine. But, you know, look, if Russell Wilson is, is going to be the MVP, I'm going to keep saying this all the way through the year, go and beat Josh Allen and the Bills. You know, and, and I don't think their defense, I know they had a few players out, Tredavious White wasn't, their defense didn't look particularly great in that game either. And then in week 10, you've got the Rams at, at Los Angeles, then you play the Cardinals, the Eagles. And then it's the Giants and the Jets. And, um, you know, I said, I think I said it last week, Robbie, maybe even the, yeah, it was before the Minnesota game. If they can get to 5-0 and in the bye, then it gives them a little bit of leeway with this next stretch of five games. If they go 3-2 and two and end up at 8-2, and two, it's not the end of the world. I accept that the Seahawks didn't look great against Minnesota. However, you know, teams have had off days. The Chiefs had an off day. The Ravens had an off day against, against Kansas City. Um, we've seen teams struggle from time to time. It's not unusual for a team to struggle and then play a lot better in their next game. Maybe they can do a little bit better than 3-2. Maybe they could go 4-1 and one in this stretch. And if you can get to 9-1, and one, you're in a very good position. I think the key is just to split those two games against the Rams so you don't lose an, an advantage there with them in the divisional race. Yeah, I mean, and this looked a lot harder, you know, previously you know we were looking at the schedule before and we thought this was going to be the tre- you know the toughest stretch with the you know cardinals and rams bills you know coming up and we're like okay this is going to be a really tough stretch but again you know you're not sure what kind of arizona cardinal team is going to show up you know they just lost one of their best defensive players um for the year and then you know the niners are super hurt and you know you don't know <clears throat> how well they're going to be playing i mean they obviously didn't look very good against miami and you know maybe we can use the same formula and hopefully do the same thing so you start looking at these and might not be as bad of a stretch as we're, we think and very winnable games I think the Bills are probably our, our toughest matchup other than the Rams coming up and you know that's back-to-back weeks that are going to be you know be really hard on us as long as we can stay healthy is kind of the key right I mean a lot of these teams are getting injured as long as we can stay healthy Russell keeps staying on fire you know DK keeps playing at you know an all pro level like and I'd like to see us get Tyler Lockett involved a little bit earlier in games I feel like the last two games he's kind of we haven't really targeted him much until later on in the in the second half and so I'd like to see him getting going earlier as well because really opens opens up the offense for us but this stretch might not be as bad as we thought get the tight ends involved a bit more as well I mean you're paying Greg Olson seven million you're paying Jacob Hollis the 3.25 million you've got Will Disley in there he spent a fourth round pick on Colby Parkinson who's unavailable and he spent a seventh round pick on Stephon Sullivan and you've got Luke Wilson kind of just hanging around I don't know for for the banter in the locker room I'm not sure exactly sure why Luke's still there um but they've got all these guys and and yet you know they don't really seem to be a feature of the offense unless I'm just not watching closely enough and they're actually doing a great job helping the pass protection I don't know but either way they've spent a lot of money on the tight ends don't really seem to be getting the most out of them at the moment so let's see a few more targets head their way if possible especially when the Seahawks may be stalling a little bit if that deep shot to DK is not there if that you know crossing route for Tyler's not there whatever try and get the tight ends involved maybe use DK as a decoy some weeks and maybe they're planning that maybe that's what the Cardinals have got waiting for them after the bye week right we're going to do our standout players and players who need to improve to finish but I love talking about the trade deadline you know I think it's got more and more exciting every year Robbie that you know we've, we've seen huge trades happen Jalen Ramsey was one a year ago uh, the Seahawks have been very active. Quandre Diggs uh, last year, Dwayne Brown a couple of years ago or three years ago. Now, God, time flies. You know, they have been very active as well ahead of the trade deadline. You've said the def- they're not finished with the defense. I, I hope that you are right. I mean, you, you just can't guarantee. I, I, we've been saying that all year. You know, all offseason, it was they're not done. They're not done. And then they kind of were done on the defensive line. They didn't, didn't do anything. 
So, and they keep kind of adding players here and there. Snacks Harrison and Jonathan Bullard have come in, uh, although Snacks is still in the practice squad and hopefully he's on his peloton as we speak, losing a few pounds. Um, but, you know, I, I agree with you that they need to bring somebody in. It's just a case of whether or not they will. Now, I wrote an article about this. Bill Barnwell has, has written a great piece where I think he listed 13 trades. I just love stuff like this. You know, it's a bit of rosturbation, but you need a bit of that during a bye week. You know, something to chew on during a quiet bye week with no game to think about. 13 trades. The Seahawks were involved in one. I don't think his suggestion for the Seahawks was very realistic. It was a three-way trade that involved Alex Mack coming to Seattle and Tat McKinley. And then uh, Jacob Hollister would go to the Ravens and someone was going to the Falcons. I can't remember who it was. Uh, BJ Finney or somebody like that was going out there. And, and it was, it's, it's not the kind of trade that's, that's very likely. However, it's a talking point. You know, he's not trying to predict the future. He's just creating a talking point. Now, the two things that I liked about it were, I think, if they could get rid of BJ Finney this year, take on another million dollars, but wipe 4.5 million off for next year, they should do it. Because clearly he's not worked out. He's just a backup centre. Go and get Joey Hunt if you need to be a backup centre or just in Britain and create some competition there for the rest of the year. BJ Finney is just an expensive free agent flop as things stand. Um, and then Tap McKinley, an interesting one. He's got the length. He's got the quickness and the speed that they like on the edge rush. You know, you're not asking him to come in and be Frank Clark. You're asking him to come in and maybe get you four or five sacks between now and the end of the season, Robbie. What do you make of him as, as a potential target, especially with the Falcons now 0-5? And, and they probably aren't going to be re-signing Tap McKinley when his contract expires. Yeah, I mean, he's a guy I definitely think they're going to move. And I, I just – the only thing I worry about is, like, I, I worry that they're going to think he's too much like Benson Mayo and they're not going to really bring him in for that reason. Um, I, I, I don't know. I would love to have the guy on our team. I think any sort of rotational defensive ends that we can get in to, to really step it up is going to be uh, beneficial for us. But I worry they also are looking at Rasheen Green and, and coming back from injury and trying to get him rotated back in. And if they're actually going to go out and make a move like this, I don't know if – like Alex Mack really makes a lot of sense either. And I love the idea that he was going out there. Cause I mean, you know, Jacob Hollister isn't getting a lot of playing time and you know, he's what 3.8, 3.2 million or something like that. So, I mean, you know, you got to shred some salary somewhere as well. And, you know, we're paying a lot of money for a guy to not play as much and we are loaded at tight end. So this is one of those moves that makes sense. And I really like Pat McKinley. I think this is a, a guy that could come in. Definitely. You can get us four or five sacks. I just don't know what this, I, I don't know how the Seahawks would perceive him. Um, but I, for me, I'd, I'd be all over that. I mean, let's be honest. You know, Tat McKinley is not going to come in and blow anybody's bollocks off. He's, I mean, he is just he is what he is. You know, he's a speed rusher. He ran a, a, ran a 1.60 10 yard split. I think he ran a 4.59. He's just got that speed and quickness that the Seahawks currently lack. Benson Mayor is not a speed rusher. L.J. Collie is not a speed rusher. Demontre Moore is not a speed rusher. You know, Daryl Taylor was supposed to be that, but it doesn't sound like he's going to be there this year. So just getting somebody, somebody who is capable of playing defensive end, who can play a few first down snaps, not just coming on third down and, and being you know, a, a real niche kind of rusher like Shaquem sometimes is. Somebody who you can put in there and realistically might just be able to win a 1v1 off the edge to give you that little bit of pressure. Now, the Falcons, you know, they're not going to say he's on a, he's on a cheap, it's the last year of his rookie deal, he's on about a million bucks this year. It will cost absolutely nothing to bring Tat McKinley in. On the other hand, it will cost nothing for the Falcons to just have him for the rest of the year. But you kind of feel like, look, they're 0-5. Are they going to be willing to sort of – you're still going to have to make it worth the while. I mean, they're not just going to get rid of him for a seventh-round pick. They might do that for a salary dump for somebody, but not for somebody who's costing as little as he is. But for a rental, if it helps you win a title, is it, you know, a chuck in a fifth rounder in there for a few games? Maybe you re-sign him if he, if he does well enough? I don't know. He's got a lot of potential there. So Tap McKinley, one option. You want, you got want to come in on that, on that, Robert? Yeah, just just one more thing about it. It's like I I look at the Falcons too, and I wonder like they just fired their GM, they just fired their head coach. Like how much like are they really going to come in and shake a bunch of things up right now and make a bunch of moves without having a, a GM? They probably want to hire their GM for them to come in and make all the moves. So I worry that Falcons are probably not the team we should target as far as like looking for trades, unless we're trying to flee somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. But I, I feel like at this point, they're probably not going to be the team that's going to be making a bunch of moves, but I could be wrong. I just, I have a hard time seeing that without a GM. I think the, what, what, here's what the Falcons won't do. They will not trade Matt Ryan or Grady Jarrett or Julio Drones until the GM is in place. Because you cannot, you, you want to say to a prospective GM, you can keep them if you want, 
but you can move them if you want. You don't want to say to prospective GM, just so you know, we've traded away a franchise quarterback and our best receiver and our best defensive lineman. But hey, we've got a we've got a bag of footballs for them for you to work with. You know what the Falcons really need to do is set this up to be an e- even more attractive proposition than it currently is. So you've got options there if you want to try and build around Matt Ryan. You can if you want to move him as an asset. You can move. Also, you want to try and acquire a top five pick so that then that's even more appealing. You can go and get a, you're one of the best players in the draft. But you also you know that that's that's why they will wait for that. And, and, and look, they have, they're about 35 million over the cap for next year. So they've got to do something before the new, new league year starts. But I don't think they're going to trade any of their major assets. Would they consider dumping Tap McKinley for a fifth rounder? Um, one, because it might help them get a top five pick. And two, because, you know, the next GM is not exactly going to go, what are you to trade him for? Well, he's a free agent anyway. So if you want him in the end of the season, just go and sign him back. You know, you, you, you know there's no difference. You've just got to pick. You've got a free pick there. If you want to, if the new GM wants Tap McKinley, go and re-sign Tap McKinley. So, you know, I, I think that there will be an option there for Ryan Kerrigan was also suggested as a as a trade option to the San Francisco 49ers, which would be very frustrating for, for me personally, because the difference between Tap McKinley is maybe that quicker, speedier, younger type of guy. But Ryan Kerrigan's a lot more, you know, he's nearly got hundred sacks in his career. Um, he's more of a proven guy and you know, veteran guy very solid I think there's more chance of him coming in just having that impact and look he's going to be it if he comes in somewhere like this he's been in Washington for his whole career he's going to be so amped to go and try and get a ring at the end of his career and I think I mentioned this before you've got 100 sacks in the NFL if you win a Super Bowl at the very end of your career you've got an outside chance of one day getting in the Hall of Fame so you know he, he may even well be looking at that I don't know if that's realistic or not for Ryan Kerrigan but 100 sacks isn't easy uh, and winning Super Bowls isn't easy so it might give him a chance to do that if I think Bill Barmore had him go in a swap for Dante Pettis and a, and a late pick. You know, Dante Pettis's value is, is nil at the minute. So basically, it's a late round pick. If there's a chance to acquire Ryan Kerrigan, Robbie, it's a bit more expensive than Tap McKinley. Well, a lot more expensive than, than Tap McKinley, a few million more expensive. They'd have to work some cap space there to get that done. But he's still a player that, if, if it's doable for a late round pick, I'm all in on that. I mean, yeah, that's the guy I want. I mean, I want Ryan Kerrigan. I just think he would fit so well in the system. I think he would be exactly what we're looking for. He can play, you know, four downs if we need him to. Um, you know, he'd be a good situational guy, a good locker room guy, and he's a proven player. The guy come in and he can help our team out tremendously. So, yeah, that's the player that I, I would really like to see us go out and target. And and I don't know how how realistic he is. I mean, I, I, I worry that Washington just doesn't want to trade anything yet. I think they still think they might have a chance. And, you know, who knows what, what they're actually thinking, but getting close to that trade deadline, maybe. And, and I, you, know, you have to wonder, does he even want to leave Washington? You know, I know he wanted to come back and get the sack record. Like he's been there his whole career. Some players just like to play their whole career there. But I mean, if he gets an opportunity to play for a ring and play with Russell Wilson, I guarantee that, you know, that's be something that we should look at. And, and, you know, they were talking about Dante Pettis in a late round pick. I mean, you know, Jacob Hollister in a late round pick would, would work well, or, you know, something like that. I, I would be all for something that, that would improve our defensive line. Quickly on some other options. Quinn and Williams, his name has been tossed out there. Now, I've got a theory on this. I think that the Jets probably would quite like to move Quinn and Williams. And they think, you know, he wasn't drafted by the GM. And I think that they've, you know, very subtly just, I just dropped that out there that, hey, you know, the Eagles might be willing to trade Quinn and Williams. And then all of a sudden, there's a few different reporters reporting it out there. People are talking, we're talking about Quinn and Williams. Other people are talking about Quill and Williams. I guarantee if you type in Quill and Williams on YouTube right now, there's probably a, a piece on there saying, should the Ravens trade for him or should the Chiefs trade for Quill and Williams? There'll be, you know, it spreads. You know, the teams use the media to, to set up a market. But I, I don't think the Jets are going to get rid of Quill and Williams unless they get a good offer. I think this is more a case of if we could get a, if they could get like a high second round pick for Quill and Williams, for example, from a team that's, you know, just see some value there. You know, maybe even a high third. You know, they, they dumped Leonard Williams, didn't they, for a third, I think, a year ago. If they can get something back, if they don't see him as part of their future, if they think he's a bit of a pain in the ass, which he kind of seems to be, then they may well move him. The only problem for the Seahawks is I, the only realistic way that I see him being traded is if they offer up their second-round pick and maybe a, a bit more. And look, I loved Quinn and Williams at Alabama. Who didn't? You know, some people thought he was the best player in the draft, better than Nick Bosa. Um, so people loved him. But you just, and look, you can go, there's a video on YouTube now of his best plays in New York from the All-22 perspective. He looks great. I'm just not sure that that's what the Seahawks are desperately needing, this kind of like very talented, very athletic, but a little bit raw interior defensive lineman. 
Um, I think they need someone who can get after it off the edge. And if you're going to take up all of your cap space trading for Quinn and Williams and, and give up a, another high pick and then go into the next draft with barely anything to use to get some cheap talent, that, to me, I'm, I'm not sure how that one sits with me, Robbie. I'll get your view on him in a second. David Irving has been announced today that he has been his, his suspension from the NFR. I don't know if that's how you, the, the technical term for him not being allowed to play. Whatever it was, he's allowed to play again. Now, people may remember this is a player who had some off-the-field issues. He's had to retire at a very early age. Has, has had, I, think, you know, I think he's admitted that he, he, he used marijuana to, to, to get through some, some tough times you know, physically, and that helped him. And now that the rules have changed within the NFL regarding marijuana, that, that he's decided he'd probably like to, to come back and give this another try. Nobody could doubt his talent. The off-the-field concerns, I think, are pushed to one side a little bit, given that the NFL's got with the, you know, the, the modern times in 2020, and, and this new CBA has changed things. Again, though, I'm just not entirely convinced that's what the Seahawks need right now. He's a player very much in the Demontre Moore, kind of LJ Collier, Rasheem Green, Jonathan Bullard type, inside-out type of guy. For me, they need somebody off the edge. And if you bring him in and then try to bring somebody in off the edge as well, who are you, who are you getting rid of? Because I wouldn't want to get rid of Demontre Moore and Jonathan Bullard right now. They actually played quite well in the last game. Yeah, I mean, the thing with him is if he can come in and have kind of like an, an Alden Smith, you know, impact that he's had already, if he can come in and make that kind of impact for our team, then yeah, you absolutely want someone like that on our team and get someone, someone who can push on the inside and, and help collapse that pocket, help those outside guys get in a little bit more. It might help, you know, an LJ Collier, or, you know, Griffin or whoever it is rushing off the edge it might give them an opportunity to get to get home faster if they're getting a, a better push and they have to focus more on the inside. So yeah, I would, you know, he's a guy that you look at and is like, man, if he could just put it together, right. If he could just get it together mentally, that's a guy could come in and he could make some real, real big impact for us. And, and I would, I would, I mean, I'm all for giving it a shot. I mean, why, why not? You know, it's week five and you know, you or week six and you've got, you know, you've got cap space, you know, throw a couple million at him, see him to come in, see if he's what he's got left. You know, it's not guaranteed money. You can cut him if it doesn't work out. So, yeah, I'm all for bringing him in. I suppose I was saying, who would you, who would you get rid of? I, you know, the, Luke Wilson. Um, I mean, look, there's no offense. I like Luke Wilson. I really I enjoy his interviews. I like him. If he had to come in in an emergency, I, you know, I, I, he'd be great. You know, if they have a couple of injuries at tight end, bring back Luke. But at the moment, he's not playing any snaps. And, 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 that's, and that's an issue. Um, they've got Penny Hart, I think, still on the roster, you know, who, who they could move. I think there's another cornerback who they, who's, who's on the roster currently because they needed that extra security with, with, with Dunbar being out injured. He could maybe go back to the practice squad. So you have got a bit of flexibility there to, to bring in Snacks Harrison, to bring in a David Irving, and then to bring on another guy I'm going to come on to in a second. I won't mention his name just for now, but they have got some flexibility there. And look, I'm sat here going, maybe they don't need that kind of player. Who am I kidding? They need everybody. You know, bring any defensive lineman in that you can get, especially if they've had any success in the league or any talent. If they're at a good age, they've got a point to prove. Bring them in and throw them in there and just get them in that melting pot and see if they can do something. Because this defense, look, the defense is going to hold the team back. The offense is a Super Bowl offense. The defense is not remotely close to a Super Bowl defense. If you can just hit and get an Olden Smith type impact, even if it's just every four games, he does something really special because of his physicality and his talent, then maybe it is worth doing. And uh, I need to revise my take as to do they really need that type of player? Of course they do. They need anybody who can get after the quarterback. Silly me. Right. Um, quickly before we do our standout players need to improve, what the heck's happening with Josh Gordon, Robbie? You know, David Irving's back. Why isn't Josh Gordon back? I mean, it, the, the league's... It's kind of taking the piss a little bit now with this. It's, it's dragged on and on and on and on. Um, it, it's time that they just let him come back into the league. He's, he's missed five games. It'll be six weeks after this week that he's missed. He was suspended at the end of last season. It's time to give him one last chance in the NFL. Yeah, I'm baffled. I don't really understand. I honestly thought when we signed him for the one-year, one-million deal that we would hear the following week or the week after that he was – the suspension had been, re, had been lifted and he was – going to be free to play so it's super frustrating and I mean you want to talk about our offensive getting better you add him to the mix and man all of a sudden we're we're looking this is you're right we're we're a Super Bowl 
winning offense right now and you add him to the mix I mean that's that's incredible so yeah it's it's time I don't really know what the holdup is it's super frustrating you know if you follow him on Twitter every week it seems like he's posting the same thing not this week not this week you know you're just waiting for it to happen so I, I don't really know what the deal is there I, I have no insight on that I just had a quick look on Twitter to see if anything had, had happened while we were live on the air so we could have a bit of breaking news reaction there Robbie but no no Sadly not, just another tweet saying that the Seahawks are now 15th on defense, according to DVOA. So everything's okay, guys. The defense is middle of the road, actually. It's 15th. It's great. It's fine. That was, a, that was a 15th in the NFL performance you saw against the Minnesota Vikings there when they couldn't stop anything. Um, so everything's all well. The Seahawks are going to win the Super Bowl. Right, let's talk about our um, first, we, 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 first quarter standout players. But it's, it's quarter point, it's 4.1, isn't it? It's five. It's Just call it five. It's five. After five games, we're into the bye week, Robbie. Standout players for you, uh, with the exception of Russell Wilson, because if you stay, you're just stating the obvious. You're not allowed to have Russell Wilson. Give us a couple of names that have really stood out for you so far. Yeah, I mean, you can't go with Russ, obviously. That doesn't count. But I'm going to go DK Metcalf. I mean, you know, what a second year he is having. I mean, you know, you look at the stats and stuff about him and how he's, you know, he's right up there with Julio early in his career. And, you know, I don't remember who it was. It was, it was Jamal Adams. That I think he said, uh, you know, he's, he's the next Megatron or whatever. And that might not be the case, but man, he's playing so good. And like, yeah, he's got frustrating drops, but you know, how awesome is it to have that true big wide receiver, number one receiver that Russ can rely on to go to, to pair with Tyler Lockett. It's just great to have. And, and, and he's, a, he's a standout these first five games. And then I'm going to go something that's going to be a little off the cuff here. I am going to give kudos to the offensive line. Yeah, I think the offensive line, it, it, you know, at the beginning of the year, we were like, oh, this is just another makeshift offensive line. We wanted continuity and we wanted like it, it to be the, the same guys and we bring all these patchwork together, guys together. And all of a sudden, I mean, they're playing, they're playing well. They're protecting Russ. Russ seems to have, Russ wouldn't have, you know, the MVP, MVP type of season he's having if it wasn't for the offensive line playing as well as they are. And, you know, it's, it's, it's great for him. It's great to see that it's a little bit different this year and not, not as bad as I thought it was going to be. So I'm going to give kudos to the offensive line. Yeah, I, we're kind of on the same page because I'd picked a, a, a fun. I actually picked what well, you picked all five of the offensive linemen and, and maybe some of the backups as well. So you kind of cheated there and, and picked a whole line. Uh, I was going to give kudos to Damien, Damien Lewis, who, you know, when I interviewed him before the draft, was immediately impressed. You know, I, I kind of wish that they'd had a chance to, to really, and look, without wanting to go over all ground, I wish that they'd addressed the defense in free agency because when you looked at this draft it was very good early on on the offensive line and the skill position so it's hard to watch Chase Claypool score what 70 touchdowns against the Eagles or whatever it was a player we talked about it's hard I know that they've replaced Clyde Edwards Alaire with Le'Veon Bell and I think the Chiefs may live to regret that decision personally um, but he's looked good and he was a player who was was very talented and available Jonathan um, Taylor, the running back, was, was another player. I think they called him Jonathan Stewart there. Um, another player, very talented, very athletic, who could have given them some options in the offseason with regard to, do you want to pay Chris Carson or not? Instead, they had to go defense. And I interviewed Cesar Ruiz, Damian Lewis, and Robert Hunt. Robert Hunt's playing very well in Miami. He looked great against the 49ers, which I like to see. Uh, Cesar Ruiz, I've not had a chance to watch him. I don't even know if he's featured that much so far, but just looked amazing at Michigan. And Damien Lewis, who looked amazing at LSU. Now, look, the offensive line's playing well, so I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm nitpicking a little bit here, but how good would it have been to see a couple of those guys, you know, for the long term, uh, filling up that offensive line? But Damien Lewis has been terrific in the run game, and, you know, he's, he, he's not been great in the pass protection like some of the other guys, but he had a really good pass pro game against the Dolphins, I think. So, um, kudos to him for coming in as a rookie with no proper off-season or OTAs and off-season pre-season, no OTAs and doing the business. And the other guy that I wanted to pick out was Demontre Moore because this is a guy who, you know, for all intents and purposes, was sat on his backside, you know, during camp doing nothing. As far as, you know, I was there, I was watching like repeats of Breaking Bad on his sofa, um, on his couch, and then got a call from the Seahawks the minute that Jadavian Clowney went to the Titans and, and the next day he was in there preparing to, to play the opening game against the Atlanta Falcons. And, you know, he, he's always been talented. You know, going back to his time at Texas A&M, he was very, very talented, Robbie. He's never quite been able to figure out the character side that is needed. And Pete Cowell, when you hear listen to him speak about Demontre Moore, is almost pleading with him, saying, 
please just, you know, he's more mature. He's got a child now. He needs to look after his child. He's changed. His personality has changed. Please just stick with that. I hope he sticks with it. And, and almost, I think Carol's unsure as to whether he will or not. That so far, so good. But can he go more than sort of six, seven months with a, a renewed sense of maturity? And I can only speak for myself as a 36-year-old dad of two that, you know, when you become a parent, things change. You know, you become a bit more boring. You have less energy to go out drinking and, 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 and whatever else that you need to do when you spare time. And, and you become more focused on your home life and, and looking after the kids and everything like that. So hopefully Demontre Moore is in there. And, and the, the way that he's playing right now and that special teams hit against Minnesota where he come flying in. Pete Carroll said it was his favorite play in the game. You know, even better than the fourth downs and, and the stop. You know, that was his favorite play of the game. I think Demontre Moore, given the price and given the area of need for Seattle in the defensive line, Two thumbs up for Demontre Moore. He's been terrific so far, Robbie. Yeah, great picks. And I actually have one more that I, I, I wanted to say and I forgot about it. I'm, I got to give it to our punter, man. Michael Dickerson, give it to him. He, he's been playing really well. I mean, penning, penning opponents inside. And, you know, we're giving up a lot, a lot of yards. So it really helps that we're able to, you know, pen it back and hopefully, you know, maybe wear out the offense a little more, but he's, he's doing really well. I mean, he's back from, you know, the second half slump that he had last year. So or a sophomore slump. So I feel like he's playing really well. So another kudos to that guy. See, if he's going to rock up wearing a hat that says big Dixon on the front of it, he better pump well for the rest of the year, because that's quite the, uh, quite the statement there. Um, right. We did stand out players, players who need to show a little bit more in, the, in the, the final 11 games of the regular season. I'll, I'll start off with this one, Robert. You started off with the offense. My two, Quandre Diggs. I think we all assumed that he was going to be great this season. It was just a given because he showed so well at the end of last year. I don't know whether it's the scheme, you know, the, the aggressive blitzing, maybe it impacted him. Now he's having to adjust again to a more conservative style. There's not quite as much playmaking going on up front. He isn't a 4-4 guy. He's never been a 4-4 guy. You know, if you're asking him to be an eraser, it's perhaps he's more of an opportunist than, a, than an eraser. But for me, he's not been near the ball. I mean, he was that last year. He seemed to be around the ball. It was, it was refreshing to have a safety who was a threat to make an interception. I've not seen him get, apart from the, the Hail Mary, which he, he kind of shot his, his main competition for that Hail Mary since we jumped Jamal Adams in the first week. You know, they were both competing with each other to get it been around the ball since then and and, you know I want to see him take a step forward because he's just somebody we assumed was going to be good this year and that may well earn himself an extended contract in the offseason now I'm kind of thinking pump the brakes there a little bit you know and and I'm looking who's a free agent in the offseason and seeing guys like Keanu Neal who are going to reach free agency and I'm kind of thinking well you know he needs to get on it and he needs to improve a little bit there so Quandre Diggs for one Shaquille Griffin is the other one for me in his contract year. And let me just read some stats out for people who aren't aware. Uh, He leads the NFL in terms of being targeted 45 times. He's given up 31 passes, which is the most in the NFL. He's given up 412 yards, which is the most in the NFL. His completion percentage against is 68.9%. He's given up four touchdowns, which is the second most in the league. And when quarterbacks target him, he's giving up a passer rating of a 108.8. Seven. And he has played Ryan Fitzpatrick and Kirk Cousins now. So you can't say that, well, it's Matt Ryan and it's Cam and it's, it's Dak. You know, he, he's not played Aaron Rodgers and, and Patrick Mahomes. He needs to do a lot better, Robbie, because right now my view on who should... I, I'm looking at Chris Carson and I'm thinking, I can't imagine the Seahawks without Chris Carson. And I know you shouldn't pay running backs or anything like that. I don't want to think of a world without big Chris running the ball. You know, I kind of think you need him. I just, he just looks better than the other running backs on the roster. He looks like they're, you know, for me, you've got Russell, DK, Tyler, Chris. They're your four that you have to have. You build around them. I don't want to lose him. I'm looking at Shaquille Griffin. I'm thinking, just get anybody with 32 inch arms. They can't be doing any worse than this. He's giving up the most passes, the most yards, the most completions the second most touchdowns, he needs to play better. I, I totally agree. You, and, you know, you hit two. I was going to use those two guys as well. So that's, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go different just because you said those two. I don't want to be a total homer and, and say the same guys. But I, first of all, Griffin needs to play 100% better. And I know that he has, it seems like he's had a couple moments where he's, he's 
been playing better, but man, he's getting picked apart a lot. And he's one of the reasons why our, you know, our defense is getting shredded. You know, he's, they, they, they target him a lot. They target Trey Flowers a lot, you know, and if you want a, you know, contract year, you know, this is the time that he should be you know, really stepping up and proving that, that we want him. So, so I'm going to go a couple of different guys here. Uh, let's see. First, I'm, I'm going to go Jordan Brooks. I mean, your first round pick, I know you didn't get to play much, uh, you know, and, and then you got injured, but like, you know, when he did play, I didn't see much from him. I, I think he, he needs to really step up the second half because I can't see Cody Barton starting anymore. So he really needs to get on the field, stay healthy, make some impact plays, show that he was worthy of that first round pick, you know, give us something to cheer for on that side of the ball and, and show us that it's something that, you know, we can be excited about going forward. So for me, Jordan Brooks, I'd like to see him uh, uh, step up and play, you know, a little bit better. And, and, and Jaron Reed, like, I know he had a really good game last week and you know I kind of picked on him earlier in the season too and then I went back and saw that he was getting double teamed quite a bit but you know where's these 10 sacks like, we need that interior pressure and we need him to show it we need him to get that push on the inside get it get it to where you're helping our defensive end because obviously we're not getting home and we need we need that inside rush to get get home as well and and stop and I know he's doing well on the run blocking but I'd really like to see him get a little more sacks and 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 you know not just not just have that as being a fluke the 10 sack season I really like to see him uh, be a little more aggressive and get some more sacks so we because we really need that and, and you know getting getting all the pressure we can up front would be really beneficial for our defense and of course we can agree that if there is going to be an MVP for the Seahawks after five games it has to be Russell Wilson but I, I don't know if anybody saw this but uh, he, he did a podcast with Bill Simmons uh, this week and, and he was kind of asked about what he does with with Sierra uh, during their downtime and he says oh we, we enjoy going on a date night and, and I just like to stare into her eyes because I'm an old romantic that way and I think Russell, can you not just go through one interview without sounding like the cheesiest bloke on the planet? You know, you're married to a, you know, a, a supermodel, superstar singer, uh, and you're the best quarterback in the NFL after five games. You know, how, do you, how, are, you, how are you those things, but one of the, the least cool people on the planet at the same time? But we love him for it, so we'll let him off. Um, we'll finish with this. We usually do a prediction at the end, Robbie. Obviously, there's no game this weekend. So very quickly, uh, Rams Niners, how do you see that one going? I think the Rams take it easy. I don't think it's going to be a question. I think it's going to be a lot like the 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 49ers and Dolphins game. It just I don't I think the 49ers are too injured. I mean you can hopefully bank on the fact that you know NFC West teams always play each other tough, so maybe it'll be a close game, but I just don't see it. I see Rams taking it pretty easy. Yeah, I see a coast for the for the Rams in that game and a, a, you know a a wide margin of victory I would say. Uh, and the Cowboys Cardinals, the other NFC West uh, team is there any chance that the Red Rifle is going to, uh, with his inspiring huddle motivational talks and, and, and his dynamism, any chance that the Red Rifle pulls one out for the Cowboys here? Yeah, man, I feel, I feel bad for Dak. That was terrible. I saw that and I just, you know, you know, contract year, all those things. I do. I do think that the Red Rifle is going to pull it out. I'm going to give the Cowboys the nod because I, I think that the, uh, you know, with the Cardinals losing, losing Chandler, Chandler Jones and that, you know, just them Steve still being young. I think the Cowboys are going to come out motivated and want to, you know, do it for Dak. And, you know, you know, Andy Dalton's not a bad quarterback. I mean, he's okay. He can, he can play. He's been around for a long time and he's got a decent arm and, you know, he's pretty accurate. I think he can lead this team. I don't think it's, I think they're going to rely a lot more on Zeke now and that's probably good, you know, and, you know, just, it's going to be, again, their defense is going to be what's going to hold them back just like the Seahawks. So yeah, I think we, I'm going to give the, I'm going to give the Cowboys the edge on this one. See, I would, I, I want to say the Cowboys, but their defense is so absolutely, I mean, it's even worse than Seattle's. I mean, it's absolutely terrible. And, um, you know, they, they made the Giants look prolific last weekend and, um, and, and the Cowboys, they don't have an offensive line anymore. You know, they used to have that great offensive line. It's gone. Um, I'm hoping that, that Andy Dalton, who let's not forget, he got to the, I think he got to the playoffs five years in a row. Uh, he didn't win any playoff games when he actually got there, but he got to the playoffs five years in a row. But I think the Cincinnati Bengals actually had a defense. Um, the Cowboys, you know, I'd fancy myself to get a, you know, a hundred yards against this Cowboys. Uh, and I've just got a feeling that Kyler Murray's going to run for a, probably a hundred on his own and, uh, and maybe throw for a couple hundred more. And, and the Cardinals are going to win that one at a canter. But, Fingers crossed, because if the Red Rifle can beat the Cardinals, then uh, Russell Wilson hopefully can the following week. Right, that's as far as I go for the podcast. We'll be back to preview that Cardinals game in a little bit more detail next week. Uh, don't forget to check out SeahawksDraftBlog.com for the best analysis on the Seahawks. Let us know what you think in the comments section about the Seahawks so far. You can give us your standout players, who needs to improve, thoughts on the NFC West, 
Who should the Seahawks trade for? Stick it in the comment section. Let us know what you think of the podcast as well. Don't forget to spread the message. You see, Robbie's desperate for you to spread the message and, and, get, them, and get it out there because he wants, he wants to be famous. He wants to be known in Seattle. He wants to go into the stores in Seattle and people go, are you Robbie Williams from that Seahawks podcast? And he wants to go, yes, and get a discount of 25%. So let us know what you think about it. Spread the message. Keep the word out there. Let people know that it exists. We'll see you next time.